Good afternoon and welcome to Florida Repertory Theater's Stage at Home Virtual Talkback series for Friday, June 26th, 2020. My name is Jason Parrish. I'm your Associate Artistic Director and your host for the afternoon. Uh, just make sure if you're a Zoom participant that you're muted uh, and we'll, we'll uh, unmute the panel as we go. Uh, today marks our 12th consecutive broadcast since April 10th and our last before we take a hiatus for the summer months. So I want to begin by thanking every single one of our loyal viewers for coming along on this journey with us. If someone had told me back in April that we'd keep this series alive through the end of June, I probably wouldn't have believed them. Uh, but because of the outpouring of support at, uh, of you, the dedicated viewers, we've kept the series alive during this difficult time. We know that coming to the theater to see plays, attend parties, and events is part of your routine, and we miss you as much as you miss us and as much as you miss the theater. So this virtual series has been something for all of us, myself included, to look forward to each week. Keep in touch with us on Facebook during this hiatus because each week we plan to rebroadcast Stage at Home reruns uh, from our Facebook page. As we monitor the ever-changing situation surrounding public health, we will assess whether it makes sense to bring Stage at Home back later in the year. But no matter what, this intermission has taught us all something about how we can engage and celebrate art and artists and the people who support art and artists, even though we can't yet gather. So whether you're logged into Zoom, signed in on Facebook Live, or listening to our podcast, welcome to the discussion. Today, I am honored to welcome to Stage at Home the cast and the director of Florida Rep's 2019 production of August Wilson's Fences. This cast is a who's who of New York and major regional stages, plus two rising fourth graders from Southwest Florida who are veterans of Florida Rep's education program. The show's director is a veteran theater artist, institutional theater leader, educator, published commentator, and consultant. So Benny Sato Ambush, Mujahid Abdul Rashid, Gail Samuels, Brian D. Coates, Daniel Morgan Shelley, Mark Alexander Pierre, John Archie, Johnny Ann Smith, and Jolie Peinado, welcome to Stage at Home. So Thank we'll you. begin today, uh, like we often do, with uh, introductions from the cast. Uh, Benny, our director, is joining us a bit later uh, because of another Zoom meeting, so if you don't see Benny's tile, don't worry, we'll be there shortly. Uh, reminder to mute yourselves if you're not a panelist. Um, Mujahid, we'll begin with you and we'll move along the panel. Will each of you tell us where you're broadcasting from and a bit about your career and how it brought you to Florida Rep? Uh, okay, well, I live in California. What brought me to Florida Rep, well, prior to that, I, I mean, I've done this seven of August Wilson's plays. Fences is my favorite of all of them. Uh, I, and doing it at Florida Rep was my third time doing it. And uh, it was one of those meant to be kind of things. Oh, oh okay, I see. And uh, it was a joy. This one, the other two were, were, were fun, but I didn't have the, the group that we had in this last one. And that, for me, made it the kind of thing where I said, okay, you know, I think I've said all I want to say where Troy is concerned because I had people surrounding that character that were, you know, we all could play ball. We all, every, every, it was even. And I never had it like that until Florida rep. Because uh, I had another opportunity to do fences after that, and I and I opted out because I said, "Hey, I've I've done it, what I needed to do on that one right then, and I wanted to go do another August Wilson character anyway." And uh, I don't know, I don't have much else to say about it, but it uh, other than it was a, a wonderful for me, uh, career-wise, that was one of the highlights of my my career for my life, actually, to be honest with. You. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And tell us, uh, did you, I'm sorry if I missed it at the beginning, where are you right now? Where are you based and where are you broadcast? California, uh, Bay Area. I'm, I live in a town called Vallejo, California, uh, which is about 37 miles northeast of uh, San Francisco. Fantastic. And I believe in this, this picture we're seeing here of another August Wilson play, Seven Guitars, uh, we spot Gail Samuels in the back. So the two That's of you her. have worked together before, yes. Yeah. That's her. 
In I'm fact, the two, the two times that Gail and I have worked together, Gail has been partially responsible for me being a part of the production yeah. in each case. Oh Florida. yeah, I, I had meant to ask, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, tell us, tell us a bit about how um, how that how it came about at Florida Rep. Um, you didn't have much time to prep it, right? No, I, I, I well, I think I got uh, you guys called me two weeks prior to starting rehearsals. Mm -hmm. I think if, if I remember correctly, but. But Troy swims around in my system. Of you know, I, 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 I read it. I probably read the play at least once a year. So I, uh, I went to work and I just felt like I wanted to be uh, as close to ready in terms of being what we call off book, meaning off script for the non-actors. Uh, on day one, I wanted to be as close to I could as close to that as possible. I find that for what, whatever's in me, whatever is going to come out, I can't bring it until I, I'm away from the words. I think we're all that same way. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I, can't be, I can't be in my head about it. I can't be thinking. I'll, in order to fly and spread wings, I've got to be away. So I said I wanted to be like that. Sure. Day one when we sat down for the table read. And when I say you didn't have much time, I mean uh, for our viewers, we you know we go to New York City every year, uh, and this year we did an extensive call this particular year for Fences, um, and then and cast the whole show. Gail uh, came out of that. Brian came out of that, um, and uh, and an actor we had cast to play Troy. And you had been in touch with us early, uh, right. months and months before, but you couldn't get to New York. So I remember seeing right. your video, but we couldn't meet you. And then, you know, as this business goes, someone dropped out and uh, we wrote to Benny and we wrote to members of the cast and Gail was the one who said, uh, if he's available, just make it happen. Uh, and so, so that's two, yeah. 10 days from rehearsal, I believe, is when it happened. Yeah, you know, things like that, I look at it, well, it was, it was meant to be. Yeah, it, it was, was it to totally be. was. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. We'll, we'll come back to you as the, as the afternoon progresses. Gail, uh, we'd love to talk to you next. Tell us where you are and a bit about your career um, and, and what brought you to Florida Rep. Well, I am based in New York, Upper West Side, right across the street from Central Park. <laughs> There's been quite a bit of activity going on in New York City, as I'm sure you can all imagine. Um, and, uh, and right before the um, pandemic, I was actually doing an off-Broadway show called Ms. Trial about a sexual assault case uh, in a law firm. So um, it was kind of interesting. The show closed and a month later we were in the pandemic. So it all kind of hit uh, very, very quickly. Um, I, I, I've had a great career. I've done a couple of Broadway shows, most recently Children of a Lesser God that uh, Benny, uh, Kenny Leon directed. And, uh, and then after that, I actually had the opportunity to work with um, Peter Dinklage in Cyrano, playing the chaperone, which was very, very, very exciting for me. So when uh, Fences came along for Florida Rep, you know, I, I, I've done the role before, but I never really feel like I'm totally done with the role. And Rose is one of those roles that I always feel like there's room to grow. Um, and um, and it was one of the few auditions that when I went to the audition, I guess when I went to the callback and Benny was at the callback, Benny was just in tears at my audition. It was the first time I've ever had that experience. He, he felt so moved by my work and it was really great validation. Um, you know, as an actor, you go to auditions, you go to a callback, you walk out of there, you think you did well, but you never really know, you know, whether you're going to get it or not. Um, so just to see Benny's reaction at my audition, I, I will say I was very, very, very moved. And it's also interesting because Mujahid and I had worked together in Seven Guitars in Portland at the Artist Repertory Theater. And there again, um, someone dropped out at the last minute and... They asked around about people, and I think uh, I recommended Mujahid. And Mujahid, I will say, has always been the one responsible for me pushing me 
to play roles. Many times I said to Mujahid, no, I'm not right for that role. No, no. I mean, I cannot tell you how many conversations I had with Mujahid about how I was not the right, it was just not the right role for me. And he was like, Gail, you're crazy. You should be playing this role. Um, and so, you know, as things worked out, you know, uh, we finally got to play it together. And I will say that this was one of my most favorite, memorable casts um, to, I have ever worked with. It was such a fine, fine, fine cast of men and young ladies and, and Benny, you know, fine director. And it was just a really wonderful experience all the way. And, and Florida, Fort Myers, I mean, it was great. It was winter time in New York. I mean, you know, I'm in Florida in my summer clothes, you know, missing winter in New York City. So uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful experience. We were very well received there and it was a great cast and it was a fine director and just, I can't say more, more positive things about it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gail. Uh, we'll, um, we'll, I'm sure we'll be back with you soon. Uh, Brian D. Coates, uh, who played Gabe in our production, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and telling us a bit about, uh, about your work and your career. Hello. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm Brian D. Coates, as for stated. Uh, I played Gabriel for the second time down in Florida Rep and was like uh, what Gail was saying. It's, it's, it's something to be able to uh, revisit. I believe Majai was uh, Troy before too, right? Yeah. Um, but it's so good to be able to revisit a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful character. Uh, so I had a great time down at Florida Rep. Um, during the pandemic, uh, I was finishing Jitney on tour um, in Seattle, which of course you know was the was where the uh, outbreak first started uh, in a big, big way. So I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we were the first major show uh, across the country to go black because of uh, the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, I remember it very, very well. It was like a Tuesday show. Uh, and uh, was our last show, and, and Wednesday morning, I believe it was like really early in March, Wednesday morning, uh, we got the, the uh, news um, that we were shutting down. And I was so bummed, not, not realizing that it was going to like take over the whole industry in the way that it did. And, um, but yeah, I, I, love, I love Gabriel. I was, I was about to uh, do it again, or I, I thought I was going to do it again with uh, Mark uh, hmm. up in, in Boston. Uh, it didn't, uh, uh, however, work out. But um, yeah, I, I was just so honored to, to be able to do that, that character once again. And, you know, you said you were doing Jitney on tour. Um, if you'll, I, there were some mm -hmm. pictures of it as we went through, but you were, you were in the, there was a production of Jitney. Was that the same production of Jitney that, that went from, uh, that went to Broadway that you were on? Yes. Is that the same production? Yes. Well, I, I covered uh, three roles on, on Broadway when it, when it uh, premiered on Broadway. Um, and on tour, I played one of the roles that I covered, and I covered two others. Uh, yeah, so we did five cities. We started in uh, Washington, D.C. Then we went to uh, Detroit, and then we went to San Diego's Old Globe. Uh, well, first we went to the Taper in L.A., and then we went to San Diego's Old Globe, and we finishing in Seattle and there's talks who knows what the industry is going to be like in months from now or even years but there's talks that they want to uh, grab some more cities for it but who knows what's happening well I hope that, I certainly hope that works out how how was it playing before all of this exploded how was it playing oh, yeah I mean it's so wow it ugh. It's such a difference 
the di- it was my first tour. I mean, and I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what to expect on on my first tour. Um, but what I learned more than anything that sticks out the most is the differences in audiences based on their regions. Mm. And it doesn't matter if it's if it's mostly black or 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 or, or the nice you know mixture of audience. It's like something about the region is like dominant in you know in in uh, reacting to the material. For instance, when we did it in DC, it was like of course mixed off. It was at arena, so it's mixed audiences, but everybody was just like so on board seattle was like that too but san diego was like the most reserved no black white it doesn't matter they would not respond at all and anybody of course we all know on august wilson it you know we feed off of audience responses in a lot of ways because it's this shared community experience based on something that a lot of people can identify with, but we got nothing in San Diego. But I, you know, I love the town, I love the city, but it was just uh, that's the, <laughs> the biggest thing that stuck out in the tour was like how different the audiences were depending on where you were. Right, right. Yeah. I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, thank you. Daniel Morgan Shelley, who is no stranger to Florida Rep or Florida Rep's audiences, tell us where you are and a bit about uh, your career and how you came to be here. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Coming to you live from Washington Heights, New York City. Actually, a few blocks away from Brian. Um, so, what's up, Brian? Um, <laughs> so, maybe about 10 years ago or so, I was first at Florida Rep with a tour of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, there we go. Yes. Uh, with the Classical Theater of Harlem. Uh, great show. We were in residence for about a month. Um, great time. And then many years passed by, and then the new play festival started, and uh, I came down for a few of those. Boom! Yes. And this is uh, this is the reading of Damascus. Uh, I, some of my yes. captions have disappeared, so I certainly apologize. But uh, this was the reading of Damascus in 2017. Yes, great play. Um, and then soon after, um, fences came up in the season, and uh, and here we are. Uh, love love working at Florida Rep. I mean, like Gail said, just being, I mean, like, aside from being an amazing theater, but also being in Florida in December and January was pretty amazing. Like, never ever in my life have I spent New Year's Eve in shorts and a tank top (laughs) and flip-flops outside, you know, dancing in downtown Fort Myers with my cast. Like, it was pretty amazing. Um, Yeah. And, yeah. And uh, now we are in the middle of a global pandemic and everything has kind of uh, shut down. Um, soon after, uh, soon after Fences, uh, once that finished, once we came back, um, I did an episode of um, The Blacklist. Um, I did an episode of, uh, another episode of Mr. Robot. Um, so yeah, things were like a little busy right afterwards. Um, yeah. And here Excellent. we are today with all these lovely, lovely uh, people and all of you all watching at home. And, and so much virtual uh, virtual theater and engagement happening. Truth. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, uh, I wanted to chat with Mark Alexander-Pierre, uh, who came to us to play Corey. Uh, so Mark, tell us where you are and a bit about your journey thus far. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm Mark, uh, right now I'm in Brooklyn. New York, so uh, the other borough from uh, where everyone is at right now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I've um, I uh, went to school, funny enough, with uh, our director. Um, he was uh, one of my professors, um, so I kind of developed the relationship with him through that. Um, and when I got out of school, I did a lot of work in Boston. Um, you know, worked at different places, and lucky enough, from Boston, was able to work uh, at you know, Actors Theatre of Louisville, so other regional places. So Boston has kind of been my my way into every other every other place. Um, and I bring that up because Benny and I, after school, would, you know, work together on readings or whatever have you. So um, when I went back to, when I was moved back to New York, 
um, I was auditioning as every young actor is um, in the city. And uh, funny enough, I was at, I just left a EPA. Um, I see Jason is nodding because he <laughs> enjoys this story a lot. Um, I was leaving an EPA and Benny calls me out of the blue and says, where are you? And I said, I'm in, I'm in New York. He goes, can you make it to an audition right now? Which I believe was, I believe you guys are at Pearl Studios. I think we that's were, where you guys- Yeah, we were over at uh, Ripley, Greer Ripley Greer. Ripley, Ripley Greer, Ripley yeah. Greer, Ripley Greer. Um, so I was at uh, the equity offices. So I was like, yeah, I can make that happen. Yeah, I can do that. So um, <laughs> I walked over um, and Benny tells me, you know, this is for Corey. This is, it, it's cold, just, just do it. And I was like, no better chance to just throw all caution to the wind. You know, I know I've read August Wilson before. I've never actually done August Wilson until actually doing Fences at Florida Rep. Uh, but I knew the character, I knew the story, and I knew August Wilson's words, and I knew what the rhythm was, and I knew what that feeling needs to be. Um, so went in there, did it, and then I think maybe a couple weeks later, uh, they say, yeah, you got it. And I was like, wow, that's Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, and, and I'll just, for reference, for our audiences who are, who don't know, I know that Sunny is on this call and Sunny was a, a she came to New York as, a, as an auction winner and she, she saw these auditions. And uh, Benny at the auditions had said to me, you know, there's an actor I, I know from Boston, but he's up in Boston. I just don't know that I'll get in touch with him. And then we came back to New York City to do callbacks the week later. So uh, I was sitting in that room with Benny and we were in our final rounds. We were seeing some of the final round people. And for whatever reason, uh, there were some excellent actors reading for Corey, just really excellent. We had really a lot of great choices. But he said, you know, there's someone that I can't get off of my mind. I, so I'm gonna call him and see where he is. And this is, you know, I spend, we spend weeks putting these auditions together and the actors who come in have had the material for, you know, 10 days usually. And, um, and so it's unusual that, you know, you would just call someone up and say, come on up and, and that they would pick up the material and just nail it like you did. So uh, it really was a remarkable experience and, and you were everything that we were looking for and everything that Benny was looking for. And I'm sure when he gets here, uh, he'll talk about it, but this business is very small and um, it starts when you're in college. Um, a lot of times the people you work with for years after are, are your college, uh, your college core group. And um, yeah. uh, it, that's, it's a perfect example of this. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, John Archie is next on the list of introductions. John, tell us a bit about yourself and where you are and uh, your history with Florida Rep, because this is certainly not your first. No, uh, I'm here. I'm in Miami. And... Uh, as you said, I've worked with Florida Rep a, a number of times uh, in the past. I've been fortunate that way uh, to be able to, uh, to live as an actor out here in the regions, as they call. I started out, as most of us do, in New York City and wound up at some point because of family back in the southeast uh, Florida and found there was lots of work for me. And uh, here I am still here <laughs> over 20 years later. And uh, I, what have I done at Florida State? We did uh, Florida, we did two uh, productions of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, we just, we did, I did a number of things here that uh, I'm very happy to have been a part of. But uh, Fences was interesting for me because I wanted to do it and I'd never done it. And this opportunity came up. I met Benny years ago. Benny's our director at Florida Stage. Not, yes, at Florida Stage. And I was hoping that we'd get a chance to work together, but it didn't seem like it was going to happen. And then boom, uh, this opportunity came up and you know, as Mujahid, I was not the first choice. Uh, someone else was, but uh, luckily for me, that person was not able to do the production and uh, I got the call and uh, got to work with one of the greatest groups of actors, if not the greatest group of actors I've ever been around. I mean, you know, in another life, we would have been paying you do this show 
<laughs> had a great time doing it. And the camaraderie, uh, it was just unmatched. Uh, and I'm still here in South Florida after 20 years or so. Uh, I, I come and go anywhere a job is that, uh, you know, that works for me. And to get to work with uh, this cast was just, you know, a highlight for me. And I've made friends that will last, uh, you know, throughout the rest of one's life. Absolutely. And your, your, uh, your appearance with us in Fences was unique because you went from us uh, over to the other coast to play the same role almost right after. Uh, so can you tell us what it was like going from one to the other so quickly? Oh, well, uh, well there, was break, there was a break in between. Uh, it was not a long break, uh, about uh, a little under two months, I believe. And, uh, you know, you just have to sort of absorb what what's there for you you know you go and you do the show with with different actors and of course the writing is so strong that uh you know the moments uh are the same in a way but the cooks are different you know okay. I, I think i had this talk with mujahid about it that you know you can eat gumbo at a lot of different places and it's, it's gumbo but it's different <laughs> Sometimes it's umbo. Huh? Uh, oh, yeah. That's nice. That's good. Uh, Thank you for that. John John Archie Can known say, for phrases like this. Yes. Yes. Someone said Brian. I just you? I'm sorry. I'm just gonna say, John, I know the cat who you replaced. I was on tour with him. And if I love him dearly, but man, the way you play that bono. Harvey Blanks could not have done that. <laughs> I, I, love, I love what you did with that role. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. He would so, have just done it differently. You're too kind, brother. Yes, I, I yeah. do appreciate no, but I, it. was wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> we've been able to see everybody or only four people at a time? Uh, it just, there are lots of people on here, so I'm not sure how your, your setup is working. Just okay, sure I can only see four people. Oh, okay, well... I hope they're the best four people. <laughs> well, uh, all of them are good. <laughs> um, thank you, John. I, I, um, I just thought I'd, I'd ask since I had a moment to do that. To ask yeah. I think if you just go into speaker view, you should yeah, be able to see us all, John view. Archie. Oh, it's on the uh, upper uh, right hand corner. Yeah. Upper right. Yeah. He's on a, John is using his Galaxy phone, I believe. So his might be oh, slightly different. So than yeah, it's different on no, a phone. It's, my, oh. it's a tablet, actually. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thanks. Well, thanks anyway, for that. And yeah, I'm cool. I'm good. I'm, I know what you guys look like. More <laughs> Gail. <laughs> and, uh, and Brian, thank you for mentioning that. I was going to bring up Harvey. Uh, it's not as though John wasn't the first choice. It's just, you know, this is always a puzzle putting it together. And there is an actor, a regional theater, New York, a Broadway actor, Harvey Blanks, who has done the the August Wilson American Century mm -hmm. cycle. He's done. Mm. He's one of the few actors who's done all ten of them, uh, wow. and has started over. Mm. Uh, and so was interested and available in New Benny. And so uh, we slated him early in the process, and then something came up uh, that right. that made that different. But it meant that we got to go back to uh, John Archie, uh, and we're so so uh, pleased that we were able to do that. Uh, and we uh, we gave you uh, you know two months of practice to go over and be perfect at Palm Beach Drama Work. So uh, so I'm I'm sure they're delighted. <laughs> Uh, thank you so yeah, much. I was not, I was yawning while the other actors were learning their lines. <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 um, excellent. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I don't know that Benny has joined us yet, but when he gets here, uh, we'll we'll chat with him definitely. Uh, I wanted to uh, open the floor now to uh, well, a reminder to our patrons or who are watching on Zoom. Uh, put a question in the in the uh, chat window. If you're watching on Facebook, put a question in the comments and we'll get to them. Uh, the last two introductions I want to make right now are to Johnny Ann Smith and Jolie Peinado, who uh, were, I believe, nine years old uh, at mm -hmm. the time of uh, uh, when they did Fences here at Florida Rep and are now both going into the fourth grade. Uh, so Johnny Ann played Raynell and Jolie was her understudy. So. Um, Johnny Ann, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself first. Tell us uh, where you are, where you're broadcasting from, and um, a little bit about your experience as an actor, both with Florida Rep and otherwise. 
Um, my name is Johnny Ann. Right now, I'm in Fort Myers, Florida. Right now, I'm in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, I've been in fences. I have. I've been in Matilda. I've been in dance classes here. I've been in summer camps. And my favorite of all of them has been fences. <laughs> Good. Because they have a wonderful cast. Yeah. And I just love them. Excellent. Aww. Excellent. I, well, I have some questions for you in a second. And Jolie, if you'll introduce yourself to us too. So I also in Fort Myers, Florida. And this was my first professional play. So it was a good experience. And I liked it. And this is a great cast. And yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And so here are some pictures of, uh, I think, uh, Johnny Ann is in this picture. This is from Matilda last year. Jolie, I have you were in The Wizard of Oz, and I have that picture over here. So there's Jolie in the in the polka dots. So they've done our camps, and um, both of them uh, did our mini stars camp a few years ago. We we broke our camp apart and and had a young uh, a camp for the younger students and a camp for um, the older students. And that is where we found uh, Johnny Ann and Jolie. Uh, that's that's sort of the place that we we uh, noticed them on stage, and so uh, whenever we have young roles to cast at Florida Rep, we go immediately to our education departments first. Um, Johnny Ann, you played the role of Raynell, and Jolie, you were the understudy, and um, uh, so tell us a, a bit about that experience of working with these actors. Uh, what did what did you both learn from this? Well, I. The, I believe this is my very first professional play, and I learned a lot. I learned, I learned a lot about this play. Like, so I learned that I could. How can I? I learned that. I learned a lot because all of these wonderful people have taught me stuff and I've been like really, I've been really thankful for, for all of you because all of you have helped me through this and you guys have taught me like to be a better actor and how to act. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and if you, I can just jump in there, she, yeah. she probably learned a lot about quick changing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, right. Uh, because all of you, you had to change so often. Uh, yeah. Um, and then I also wanted to ask Jolie, uh, since we're since we're here talking about it, you as the understudy, you got to go on. Uh, so tell me about that experience. You got to do the last few performances. Yes. I never thought I was going to be able to go on stage, so when we got the call that we were going, I was so happy. It was great, and it made me feel happy, and when I had the experience backstage and getting on, performing in front of all these people, it was a cool experience, and I really liked it. Excellent, and you were excellent in it. Both of you were. Um, going back to uh, uh, those of you who have done a number of August Wilson's plays, I wonder if for those for those of our audience members who might not know, um, if Gail, Mujahid, uh, Brian, if if one of you or all of you could talk a bit about August Wilson's work and specifically the American Century Cycle, and tell us uh, why those ten plays are so important and what those ten plays were meant to do. Uh, so, uh, if any one of you wants to start us off uh, as we chat about August Wilson and why he's important. Well, I found, as I, I've been in seven of them so far, but I've read them all. And what I realized is, in a, in a, in a way, he somewhat chronicled the African-American experience over a hundred year period or so. I think starting with what, 
1894 or so and ending in 1994, 1997, something like that with radio call. Uh, basically giving you a, a snapshot of where we were at whatever particular decade, although he didn't start out to write a decade by decade thing. It became a thing of his at one point, at a certain point in time. But you take like, for instance, Jitney uh, and what was going on in the 70s. That's in that play, Two Trains Running, which is an interesting play because the, you got the word, I'll just say the N word is in there more than any other of his plays. Uh, it's in there a hundred and something times. But when you look at what was going on, that play takes place in 69. It's the older characters, Memphis, Wes, Holloway, who use the word a hundred and something times. As you get down to the younger people, Sterling and Rissa, they use it maybe three times. And in 1969, that would have been me. I would have been their age and, and our, um, uh, we were, you know, black studies, closing down universities, uh, moving away from that word and, and, and things associated with that kind of thinking. And I found it brilliant of August that he captured that because it was the older folks who were still slinging that word around. You look at piano lesson, uh, and there you're dealing with the agrarian society. You know, do we give up our land? and things like that. Uh, he, he, a very, very interesting writer. And, I, and, and, and that's the way I see his work, uh, mm -hmm. part of it anyway, as well as the interesting characters and the acting challenges and this and that. But overall, <laughs> if you look at the body of work, in a way, he got a chance to put it on Broadway. This is where we were. And he, and he also got a chance to express what was on his mind because if you're going back to two trains running holloway's uh, uh monologue about well i'm gonna just say it just so we can make it plain stacking niggas right. and in other words the reason sterling can't you can't get a job is he's not stacking any more niggas all the railroads in the ground the, the, this, the, 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 the railroads are laid the telephone poles up he doesn't need you anymore that's why you got a problem and he says he stacked so many that it got it wrapped around the moon seven times. So August is speaking his mind through these characters, letting you know what, what he really thought about the thus and so, you know. But anyway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Gail, Brian, anything to add? Well, I would just say that the that the significance uh, of of August Wilson's work is that for the first time that I can recall in my career, we have a black playwright who is writing about the black experience, who captures us in our own habitats, speaking in our own cadences and, and, and exposing a, a world of, you know, to a world of people who know nothing, who may know nothing about you know, what it is, live black or talk black or act black or whatever, eat black, you know. Um, and so what he has given to the theater community as actors and as just as people is a, a, a treasure chest of opportunities to share with the world uh, his words and, and his um, experiences and his gifts and the joys and the heartbreaks and the disappointments and the struggles uh, of what it is like growing up in America as a black uh, human being. Um, and I think that is why he is so revered amongst clearly all black actors that I know, um, is that finally we have something, we have somebody to grab onto that has also provided work for us as actors. I mean, you know, I can't tell you how many productions of, you know, shows I've done where I've been the only black actor, you know? But when I'm doing an August Wilson play, I know I've got a new family um, to, to, to work with and to bond with and to share stories with. 
And just the way that August writes, it makes it so easy to uh, relate to his characters because he's finally writing in a way that we speak or in a way that we can, you know, uh, respond to. We all have, um, generally, you know, I love when we have table reads before a show because he, uh, before, before a show begins rehearsal because it gives an opportunity for all the actors to sort of share experiences, you know, of why some of these um, characters in his plays are relatable to us. It's a way of us um, coming together. And the one thing that I think August um, is established that I know that every body who I know who's ever done an August Wilson's play, play is that as a cast, you always break bread together. That has been a theme that has gone around the country. I'm sure Brian, you can, Majai can attest to that. And what it does in any cast, when we get together around food, it's a bonding moment. And that's some, and it's sort of like an August Wilson tradition, um, you know, so to speak, that has gone around the country. Uh, I know everyone that I've known who, who have ever done a play that August has written, it's it's kind of the, the thing that you do. Um, and, and because as black people, that is something we do as, you know, we get around food and we talk and we socialize and we bond and we learn from each other. And so, um, yeah, his, his, his voice um, will resound forever. And I yeah. always feel like it's a gift to be given the opportunity to speak his words. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Hey, man. I just want to say real quick, <laughs> Jitney was the final play of the 10 play cycle to make it to Broadway. Right. The final. Now, I just want us just to think about that in itself. No American playwright has ever batted a thousand, so to speak. Yeah. With all of their plays, to make it to Broadway. That says it all to me. Wasn't Jitney his first play that yes, he wrote? It was. If I'm it, not was. Mistaken? it sure was. Okay. You see how it all comes back around? And it yes, was, it premiered off off Broadway. What'd you say, it, Mr. Archie? Well, I first saw Jitney with the original mm -hmm. cast in Chicago. Me too. And that was in the 90s, I believe. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And it was wonderful. I mean, I had, it was, and I- Mary McClinton. Got to have a drink with August Wilson. Nice. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point in time, I had no idea how lucky I was. Wow. <laughs> I feel I the mean, same I way knew, when I met him. I had a marvelous experience in the theater. In fact, well, just let me say, what happens? I went to Chicago for a family reunion, found out I had two friends in the show got to Chicago on my flight, had them drop me at the theater, and I bought every ticket I could get for my family. And yeah. I called them up and said, y'all come over here. We were having a family reunion. <laughs> so I kind of packed the house with my family that night <laughs> and uh, waited at the theater until the show because it was too much for them to come back. And we saw a wonderful production of Jitney, which I have no idea why it didn't go to Broadway. It was the economics and the politics of, you know, the theater world, because it was a marvelous piece of theater. Yeah. And I afterwards waited, of course, to see my friends and who comes mm -hmm. into there's at the Goodman, there's a, there was a little bar where you could have a drink after the show or at intermission. And so I waited for my friends and who comes out to talk with the people who were hanging out but yes, August sir. At first, I didn't know he. I didn't know he was. I didn't know he was the playwright. Uh, but uh, got to, you know, to have a chance to talk with him, and the Chicago audience loved the play. I oh yeah, yeah. how can you not? Yeah, yeah. this play I, um, was. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Daniel. Okay. I uh, I'm from Chicago, and that production, that original production of Jitney, was the first August Wilson play that I had ever seen. Wow! And uh, I was a student at Columbia College at the time. I was only there for a year, but the first August Wilson play that I read uh, for one of my acting classes was Fences, and it was you know just touching on August Wilson as a playwright. It was the first time where I read a play, 
and I felt like I was reading characters who spoke like me, who spoke like yes. my family. Like I was like, mm. oh, this could be, like I feel like a little while later, I was with my family for Thanksgiving and I was like, this conversation that everyone's having around this big table would easily be a scene in an August Wilson play. Mm. You know, And that just adds to the ease of playing the characters and the relatability of the stories, you know? Um, wow. Cause I did, uh, I done fences, and then I also did piano lesson. I played Avery in piano lesson. Um, oh. So two of the ten, you know, we're the goal is to get, you know, to get yeah. all of them. Yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I'll tell our audiences uh, real quick that uh, August Wilson's plays uh, have well, he's been nominated for seven Tony Awards. He won uh, once, uh, and that was for fences. Um, his yeah. two Pulitzer prizes were for fences, and I believe uh, the piano, piano lesson. lesson. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, now let's go to Benny. Benny Ambush uh, is uh, the, the, the man who directed the, the, our production of Fences. So Benny, if you wouldn't mind introducing I, yourself to us and telling us where you're coming from. I apologize and, for my lateness. I had a, a prior commitment. So hello, everybody. So nice What's to see up, the family Benny? again. Hey, what up? Hey, hey Benny. Hey. Hi, 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 hi. So what they said, <laughs> oh, they all said, um, you're talking about breaking bread, uh, Gail. I'm also remembering how we put a little something, something in that holiday rum cake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes, we won't go did. into details about that. Oh, Let's just say if, if somebody lit a match, it would have been a fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, there was a question you had. Yeah, I wanted night. you to just tell us a bit about you, your, you and where you're broadcasting from. Uh, a bit about your career and um, yeah. uh, how you approach a play like Fences and how you yeah. approach it um, differently than another play. Yeah. Or uh, I'm a director, a producer, educator, published commentator and consultant. And I'm uh, uh, in the Boston area right now. Um, actually, I directed Fences for the first time in 1991 at the Oregon <laughs> Shakespeare Festival. Uh, but first got introduced to August Wilson by seeing James Earl Jones play Mujahid's role in Come the mid-1980s. <laughs> Come wow. on now. In the 1980s. Look at all these pictures of me that you found. Um, <laughs> and in those days, um, August Wilson um, personally approved every director of any of his plays throughout the country and throughout the world. I had to, I had to go by him and get approved by him. Uh, and I'm glad he said yes. Um, so... Uh, there's a Nigerian Yoruba proverb that goes, a river that forgets its source will surely dry up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for August Wilson, he's reminding us, Africans in the New World, who we are and where we came from. And in the spirit of Sankofa, that two-headed bird from African cosmology, that has one gaze looking behind you and one gaze looking forward, that you have to know and make peace with what's behind you and where you came in order to chart a path for the future. So that for me is the core of doing any of August Wilson's work in his canon. And um, just being true to myself as a black person in this country and knowing what um, living a dream deferred feels like, sounds like, looks like because that's um, a common experience for us out here. So, and all the things that you said that I came in on the tail end of, including um, that wonderful language and the cadences and the rhythms of uh, and the music. Express ourselves in the music in that language, you yeah. bet. Um, You've got to tap say... into that, you know, because if you go too slow, it falls apart. Yeah. You no? Know? I did a production of Seven Guitars along with Mujahid in Portland. <clears throat> I played Louise. And Louise has this fabulous monologue in the second act. And I remember Costanza came to the play, mm -hmm. uh, which is August Wilson's wife, um, came to the play. She lived in Seattle, so she didn't live far from Portland. And, 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 uh, and the one thing I will say about that Louise monologue, it is 
it was music. It was like jazz, you know, the House mm-hmm. of Blues, the Blue Goose, the Red Carter, the Dead Rooster, the this, that, and the other. Hurry up and sit down and let's dance and give me a drink. And what I got, anyway, I won't, but it's, it's something that you'll never forget. But I, I remember that Costanza came to the play and she was so complimentary. And I felt like, you know, I had, I had nailed it or whatever with her being there. But it did remind me that a lot of his writing is is like music. And if you approach it from that standpoint and find the rhythm and the highs and the lows of it, you know, it really helps to tell the story and paint the picture. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same way like with doing with doing Shakespeare. If you ignore the poetry of it, then you're not gonna get it right. Like there's a rhythm to it. Uh, there's imagery to it, there's passion to it. And if you don't tap into the rhythm and the flavor and the poetry, then it's not gonna land with her. It's, it's not gonna land yeah. quite right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Brendan Powers, who's one of our ensemble members, asks this question on Facebook. He says, what is it that happens in the rehearsal room and then on stage among artists that make an experience like Fences exceptional and so fulfilling for you? Mm. Anyone want to take that mm. away? Mm. Well, um, I would love to jump in. One thing yeah. that that was really amazing about this production, like this cast and also this director, because I've worked on shows where directors are tyrants in the room and they are not collaborators and they do not look at what you are bringing to the table and what they're bringing to the table and melding it together. They want it mm-hmm. to be their way and if you don't do it their way, then it can be a problem. Not a lot of directors, I'm not gonna name any names, but I feel like the director sets the tone of the room and all of us were extremely blessed to like have a director who was really, really cool and set a loving and collaborative tone in the room so that like all of us as individual storytellers could tell the story together. Appreciate hearing that. Can I riff on that just for a moment? Please. And I'm gonna use you, Daniel, as an example. We talked about this early in rehearsals and about whether Lion smoked. Mm-hmm. And you decided to weave that into your character, which was fine with me. And then I would watch you on breaks from rehearsal. Everybody else is going to the bathroom and whatnot. And you're working out the business, how to pull that cigarette out, get that Zippo lighter, flick the thing up, get the, the saxophone case, the, the hat, the, I mean, and like, over and over and over again, drilling that until it became dropped in and second nature to you. Yeah. Um, that kind of stuff. Directors, ain't no director that brilliant to be able to give that to an actor. That comes from actors who are putting something on the table and meeting a director halfway at least. So Thanks, man. Um, that's just one example of many things. And you all did similar things like that. Uh, I'm working at going- cigarette. Yeah. yeah, I'm going through these pictures because I know there's a picture of Daniel here with a cigarette somewhere. Uh, but, uh, so sorry, but I didn't find it in time. Um, but there he is. Uh, does anyone else want to speak to Brendan's question before I go to uh, some of the other questions? Yeah, well, I, actually. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Brian. No, no, go ahead. No, um, uh, there was, um, at least for me, like walking in that room, you know, uh, as da- as to Daniel's point, that you have a director who kind of sets sets the the groundwork for the play the, the groundwork for the playground that we're all going to be on, right? And then you know, uh, and then in comes Mujahid, who is who is playing Troy, the, this bigger than life character, and he himself set a tone, you know. And for me, being the, the youngest member in in the in that particular cast of, of people at that moment right um i'm not younger than johnny ann or jolie but <laughs> um but uh you know kind of how watching everybody set a tone with what they're coming in with their, their character and even just like they're just overall giving giving this as actors as a pe- as people it almost makes you feel like you anything less than that anything less that you're bringing than that you're not you're not adding to the gumbo, as John as John put it. You know what I mean? Like, if everyone has their own ingredient to this gumbo that's going to taste great, but then you come in with something that's just not that wasn't on the paper. You know what I mean? Then like, 
that's that's what it felt like. It felt like everybody was bringing in their own recipe to this wonderful meal that we gave the audience, right? Or that we wanted to give the audience. And everyone's uh, particular ingredient was, you know, just enough spice, just enough kick, just like, it just, it was just the perfect mesh of everything um, that it's, it's just infectious. I guess that's the way to put it for me. It's just watching everybody hold their own. And then that makes you want to be that much better because you don't want to be the weak link, you know, in this group <laughs> of like incredible people, incredible, incredible talented people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yeah, Gail? And I would just say that when you're in the rehearsal room, when you're in the rehearsal process, you know, you're finding things and you're developing your character and you're still, you know, finding your lines, learning your lines, you know, trying to bring it all together in the rehearsal room. When you go from the rehearsal room to the stage, right, now you have a set and then you have a whole nother level. You have lights, mm. you have tech, you have costumes, you have quick changes. So whatever you have established in the rehearsal room has got to be so solid mm -hmm. that when, so that when you bring it to the next level, which is the stage, you don't lose what you have found in the rehearsal room. And it becomes another layer that you're adding on to the work that you've established in rehearsal. And when you get to that stage and you have the lights and you have the set and you have, and you, now you're still finding stuff. You're finding, oh, I can sit on this side of the porch or I can sit on these stairs or I can go up and I can, and I can slam that door and I can look out. You know, it's, a, it's adding another layer to the, to the work that you've already done in the rehearsal room, which is why the rehearsal period has got to be so solid because when you're adding those other levels, right, it, 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 you don't lose what you found in the rehearsal space. Absolutely. And Benny, uh, now that, Gail, thank you for that segue to talk about the set. Benny, if you wouldn't mind chatting with us a bit about the set design. Uh, Richard Crowell designed the set. Yeah. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind talking about your choice or is it scripted um, to, to see the kitchen uh, you you know, on our set, you could see into the kitchen, and so you were able to yeah. use that yeah. uh, throughout the play. First of all, I love me some Richard Crowell. <laughs> he and I go way back. We started working together in the 90s, the last millennium, and uh, it was a joy to be reunited with him. Um, part of that idea came from Edward Harper, the painter. You know those nightshade images? Is it nightshade? You know those paintings? with the big windows in a yeah. restaurant. Yeah, long. absolutely. So I'm not sure if that's what it's called. So you can see inside. So part of that was that. And part of what we came up with with this um, design was from the African-American painter Archibald Motley and his unique color palette that is, of his work that is just gorgeous. You can Google him, Archibald Motley. And there was also some concepts from um, the great, great 20th century scenic designer, Joe Melziner, and a uh, philosophy of scenic design where you have uh, painted scenery on the outside representing reality. And then the closer you get into where the playing areas are, things become real. So that was a blending of both painted scenery on the outskirts and then as you iris in where most of the playing takes place all the scenic elements become real that's a joe melzina concept there's a term for it that i'm forgetting right now so when when richard and i get together we there's a lot of heady stuff going around <laughs> right but it usually turns out great like this did. Uh, yeah, for those for those audience members who uh, who know who've been watching Stage at Home, Richard Crow also designed Alabaster, uh, which we went in depth with uh, not too long ago. Um, and uh, and here's a picture of the set so you can see uh, what a uh, little bit more clearly what Benny's talking about. Um, and we'll take a moment now to also shout out to Danielle Preston who designed the costumes uh, for the production. Todd Wren, another ensemble member like Richard who did the lights. Uh, Lisa Lamott was the stage manager for that, and Katie Lowe, the sound designer. So I uh, just wanted to uh, make mention of them. Um, 
Uh, Benny, while I have you here, um, there's another question here in the chat window, um, and anyone can feel, to an feel free to answer this question, but Benny, I'll start with you. Uh, Stephen Garrett asks, the 50s were a decade of Brown versus Board of Education, the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, and other actions that um, uh, sort of predate today's Black Lives Matter. Um, is fences that much more relevant today? Is fences political? Uh, or is it political since it's so personal? It's all of that. It's political yeah. and personal, and the personal is political, and the political is personal. It is all of that. And the story, the struggles, the obstacles that those characters in Fences are battling against and trying to overcome are still with us. And it is part of a 400-year story, legacy, ever since Africans were brought here to New World America. And that's a story still being told. We are in a particular chapter now that in many respects I've seen before. Cities on fire, protests in the streets, a lot of hope for change in the air. It hasn't happened yet. I hope it does. I'm cautiously optimistic, but it ain't been done yet. And I have seen before when we've had these rises and then things cooled off a little bit and then reverted back to the same old, same old, even further back. And so we'll see. The jury is out. But we are at an inflection point right now in the nation. It's on a knife's edge. It can go anywhere at this point. We're central to that story. Africans in the new world. This is the term that August used to call us. And it makes sense. We're central to that story because what has happened to us is a metaphor for this country uh, still trying to live up to all those lofty pronouncements in its enabling legislation, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, all of that. So the story is still being told. It's all relevant because it's all the same story, different chapters. Yeah. And uh, as, as we mentioned before with the American Century Cycle, uh, August Wilson wrote these 10 plays. Each of them takes a different look at the, the experience of Africans in the New World in a different decade. And Fences uh, is, of course, the offering for the 1950s. Anyone in the cast uh, want to answer that question or speak to that same question? Well, I think there are a lot of themes and in, in fences that certainly ring true with what's going on in the, in the world today. Um, you know, black father trying to teach his black son, you know, how to survive, you know, um, uh, uh, how to avoid maybe some of his own pitfalls, trying to save his son from being, you know, uh, from being, I don't know, uh, uh, labeled in ways that his own father was, you know, um, not having the opportunities that he felt he deserved, even though he was the best, you know, baseball player out there. He never made it to the major leagues. You know, they're trying to protect his son from, you know, the same kind of, of racism or, um, you know, that he experienced and, um, and, and that struggle. Um, you know, Rose, the mother, trying to hold, be the glue of the family trying to hold it all together. And she also has her dreams deferred as well. Um, I, I, I think it's a, it's a typical microcosm of the black family that even though that was the 50s and this is 2020, hasn't changed, hasn't changed that much. It really hasn't changed that much. You know, Troy had a couple of battles to do <laughs> in, inside of the play itself. Uh, along the lines of race. There is the thing of, <laughs> it seems absurd to even talk about it, but it, it, it is what it is because it was at real at that time. Uh, black men couldn't drive a truck, a garbage truck. You could ride on the back, jump off, and in those days, they didn't have the automatic arms like they do now to go down and lift your cans and bring them up. You had to physically lift those cans, dump them, put it back. But you couldn't drive the truck. So he had that, as well as he, he had the knowledge. He, he didn't, couldn't come to grips with the fact that he was, it, it just wasn't time yet. But he deserved to play in the, what in, in baseball terms in the big show for as good of a, a player he was. 
but they weren't ready. They didn't. They weren't ready to bring someone of, of African who was an African American into the league. So uh, you know, he he had these, these these things swimming around inside of him, especially the baseball thing, because that one I think ran very deep within him, and that's 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 part of what we're talking about today: opportunities that have been denied that are coming to light, you know, in, uh, you know, COVID. Uh, yeah, and also, if you, if you look at Kaepernick, who, you know, took the knee, right? Yeah. To protest uh, black Peacefully. racial injustices, yeah. right? Yeah. And he was blackballed, right? His whole NFL career went down the tubes, you know, and here we are years later, and everything that he stood for is basically what we're fighting for today. and. Was right. I mean, the NFL yeah. had to apologize to him, you know, because nobody was listening. Nobody wanted to understand what his what he was standing for. Yeah. Um, so you know, was lost. You know. I, Gail touched on it on it a little bit, and I'd like to reinforce it because she she is such in person is such a strong, wonderful presence, you know, as a black woman, you know, and she handles herself so wonderfully, and just to you know what I mean? Just as, as soon as we, we, we came online, she was like, I miss my, I miss, miss my, my men. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's, that represents her rose. That represents who she is. And I just want to touch on the, the resiliency also of the black woman in August Wilson's place. Because a lot of people want to say that he didn't really write for, uh, write really good roles for black women. You've heard it before, I'm sure, Gail and everybody else. But the fact remains that you can't name one play where the black woman, even in Jitney, has so shaped every single man. And they talk about it and they tell it. And then, you know, even with the small character that I played, Fillmore, I mean, all everything was about his woman. Everything was about his lady and about his love for his you know it's even it's the smallest details because august wilson loved his mother he loved the black woman so for it to for us to dismiss just because most of his plays you know have a lot to do with the black males but to dismiss the black woman in his plays is to do it an injustice because they are so shaped by women like gail and women like gail's parents and mother and and their, their grandmother and all through all of our ancestral uh, black women. We're so shaped by it as black men, even today. So I just wanted to say that. Well, amen and a yeah. woman too. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, to, 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 to talk about sort of where we are, uh, both as an industry and as a country, uh, Benny, you talk about it being a, uh, on the edge of a knife, right? Um, what, what, in your view, can theaters do to help us to heal? What, in your view, can theater do to help us heal? And how can theaters do that better um, on their own? You asking me? Yeah, sure. Why don't we start with you? Uh, paint the destination. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. <clears throat> Show us through theatrical storytelling how it could be. Show us what's wrong with where we are now and how to get there with some beauty and some joy along the way. I'm writing that down. It's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Benny. Um, Any, anyone else? Yeah, I, yeah. I just want to share something. So I did a, uh, the national tour of Little House on the Prairie. I was the only African-American female in the cast. And um, when I got into the show, I was actually quite shocked. Um, but I took it upon myself to educate my white colleagues, director, cast. Every day I would come into rehearsal and I would give them the African-American fact of the day. Yeah. I, uh, because I had to understand who my character was. How did I come onto the prairie? Were there, were there, you know, blacks on the prairie? You know, uh, Oscar Michoud, first black filmmaker, 
right? Was a prairie man, you know? I named my character Sally Bain, who was the first African-American female to head west in, his, in the history books, right? Um, and as a result of that, by educating, by me taking the time to do my research and to, and to share with, with, you know, with my cast who we were, why we were there, how we got there. And I was like, look, I need a rifle, I need a hatchet, I'm a single woman on the prairie. My poor understudy was so <laughs> mad at me because she had so much stuff to carry. But I was like, you know, I was really trying to, you know, develop my character so that it was based in reality. And as a result of that work, the writer renamed my character Sally Bain in, hmm. the, in the show as a, as a sign of respect for the work I had done in educating. So even when we are in a situation where you think there aren't black people, there wouldn't be black people on the prairie, that maybe I was just the token black girl who they felt they had to hire for that show, I wasn't. I was representing a whole cast of characters who were present as black people on the prairie. And I took it upon myself to educate them about it. And so at the end of the day, Everybody knew a little bit more about black history, you know, mm. because I was there. See. So I, I said that to say, it, you know, include us and understand that we were all, we've been here a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and we got lots of stories. That's right. Well, that's a blessing. I, I just want to say that's a blessing for you, Gail, to have had that experience because there's, I've had experiences where it wasn't quite that same way. I did a world premiere in Denver. I won't name the playwright, but she's very well, very well produced Broadway and elsewhere. But I was the only black character in that particular play that she was writing. But when I addressed the fact of being a black man in the midst of all of, you know, everyone else on dinner, and it took place in a bar, um, she, she let me know nicely, but let me know, but that's, I'm not identifying race for a reason, but that's where it gets a little tricky, you know, is because I read something the other day and maybe y'all can help me who, with uh, the person who said this, but every American uh, literature is about race. Mm. Someone said this it's and I liked it. Okay, there we go. Every, you know, and I, I, I hadn't even thought about it before until I was like, but to just diminish someone's yeah, because the fact remains, I'm a black man in this. And it's true, it doesn't have to be about race. It doesn't have to even mention race. But there should be some sort of acknowledgement of that. Because the people watching that nobody play Nobody's colorblind. Go yeah. ahead, Daniel. I'm sorry. No, no, you're right. Because the people watching that play are seeing a black man play the role. Right. They don't see a... Uh, they don't see a colorblind <laughs> actor colorblind. playing this role. They say, oh, yeah. this character is a and black man. What is this about? And when I'm dancing, the slow dancing with the white woman, beautiful, wonderful actor. That's scene. Uh-huh, that is a However scene. However you interpret it as the audience is on you, but let's not act like it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, yeah. yeah. I don't know how I got off on that, but you reminded me, Gail, when you said that. No, it's exactly. But yeah, it was a blessing yeah. for for that to happen to you, because it doesn't well, race, always. Yeah. Race is always the elephant in the room of American experience. Mm. I mean, it is. And you can't ignore that elephant. And recently we've seen that elephant rage. And it takes me back in the jawhead, you too, I'm sure, and Benny. To our youth, we have seen this before. We're just open for a different outcome. But we've seen the cities of America burn. And if things don't change, they will burn again. Hopefully, they will change. What, you know, what Baldwin, the, say, oh, uh, to, Baldwin sure. says, to deny one man his humanity diminishes your own. Mm. And until we all understand that, all of us, black, white, and whatever, it won't be right. Thank you. 
Thank you, John. I wanted to ask each, oh, did, Daniel, did you have something to say to add to that? Uh, yes, just to throw in a little of what everyone kind of touched on, like Benny started with, you gotta know where you're going. So as theaters, you have to know why you want to tell certain stories. Like tell, mm -hmm. tell all the stories, um, but know why you're telling them. And then also, like Gail made the good point that she went in and she educated her cast, <clears throat> but also, the people running the theaters, I feel like also need to do their due diligence in educating themselves on why you're telling these certain stories and who we're trying to reach with the stories. And I mean, I know that a lot goes into like developing, um, developing a season, you know, of shows and what you're gonna do for a lot of different reasons. So start with what Benny was talking about and being like, where you're going and why and then do take the time on your own to do the education on why you want to tell these stories, what are gonna be the best ways to tell these stories, and then include the artists who would be involved with telling those stories and having Absolutely. honest conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, uh, before I ask the, the panel for any final thoughts, Greg uh, Longenhagen, our artistic director, wanted to say a few words to you all. Uh, and I, I can't believe that this discussion, uh, we're already, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's just going by so fast. It's, wow. it's been wonderful. Yeah, it, fun. it sure, yeah. I agree, I agree. Gosh, it sure has, it's going on five o'clock. Um, yeah, you know, I'm just, I just, in, in light of everything that was just said, you know, recently about, and Gail, I love all of that information. Um, you know, chatting about what you did on Little House on the Prairie and how that, that's so poignant. And, and, it's, and it's something that in so many ways is so simple, you know, but so brilliant because it, it's, it's, it's what I think is, is the, uh, one of the major issues is it, it comes down to communication. It comes down to like, you know, people, people who uh, don't wanna, uh, you know, who, who aren't communicating with other people or, there, or there's no cross-referencing in terms of other people's experiences and what's going on. It's so easy then for people to, if you don't know, then it's not it's not part of the the makeup and what's going on in their hearts and in their heads. Whereas you know, with this communication, uh, where you know where people are talking to one another and talking about it, I feel like that's where it has to start. I love the theater and I love being in the theater because I think it's such a wonderful uh, platform to have these conversations because it's not threatening. It's not a threatening thing. People, I don't think, feel threatened by, you know, you can come into a space, you can have, you can listen to these conversations, you can you can be exposed to these stories, and then you can go home and you can digest it. I think it's like the perfect venue. Uh, uh, and storytelling, and we can, you know, we could go on, and I know, Benny, you could have a million things to say about this, but it's so essential. But we, we all, there's so many different stories. We all have to be telling all of these stories in different places so that the communication happens and that people are aware of it. Benny, I love what you said about, and I know Jason, you wrote it down. I'm glad you did, I didn't, but I won't, I won't forget it. But, you know, paint where we're going and paint where, you know, where are the positives? Look at where we are now and, and you know, exposing what's wrong with today and looking at the positives in the future because I don't think that everybody has that capacity to go there. When I say everybody, I mean, audience members, until you tell the story, until you paint the picture, until you communicate, some people don't have that in their heads. So we, we have to continue to do that. We as theater artists, we have, to, we have to continue to do that because without that platform and that communication happening, people just aren't, they're not gonna know. It's all, it's that, that's all that, it's just like you don't know what you don't know, mm. right? Until, until some, somebody kind of enlightens you and, and en enriches you. So I, I did want to say that because I felt that so much of that was so poignant and so beautifully and eloquently by all of you was so, you know, professed in terms of what, you know, how we can affect change, how we can affect positive changes for a, a positive tomorrow. And I think that that's so, so important. Um, what I wanted to say, uh, the two things really that I wanted to say before we went down, you know, that into that channel, which was so important that we did, I mean, it's really, it's probably the biggest reason why we why we should gather in groups. Or frankly, it's probably the number one reason why we all should do do so. Um, but I just wanted to say that you know this production was so. And I, Benny, I we've known each other. I was a big fan of yours from way way back when you were at at Florida Stage when you became acquainted with John and 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 everyone spoke so highly of you. You were you were like 
I mean, you were like the king of Southeast Florida. But um, I, I, I just want to say that um, this production is easily one of my favorite, if not my favorites. Uh, and I've seen almost everything that's been done here over the last 22 years. I, I was so engaged in, in this. Um, and I had just come on board not long before that onto, onto um, the team here in, ter in terms of operations. Um, but I, I know, and I know Sonny posted something, how proud this, what, you know, the board was for this production, but it was, I, I loved being at the theater when people came out of that theater at the end of that evening, because you can tell. And when you're, you know, when you're running the show and you want to, you know, that's what you go is when you look for what's going on inside their hearts and in their heads now that they've just had this experience. And it was, it was tenable. I mean, you could feel that, that what you guys were able to accomplish as a team on that stage. And, and I've seen several productions of Fences before this, easily my favorite. And I saw production, uh, uh, where was the last one? Anyway, it's not immaterial, but, um, but I just wanted to tell you, I mean, it was, it, I was so, I could not have been more proud of, of this work, uh, of what you guys did. And I want you to know, I mean, just being a fly on the wall and popping upstairs every once in a while to catch pieces of the show and watching people as they came out of the theater was, was a thrill. And those folks that, that came to this show and saw this production, uh, there were so many amazing conversations that, that, that this, this production sparked. So I just want you both to know that. And then before I go, I just want to put, give a nod out to our associate artistic director, Jason Parrish. He has put together, spearheaded this program, uh, the Stage at Home program. This is the last one. We're, we're hoping maybe to get back to it. I'm, I'm trying to convince Jason. It's a lot of work on his plate <laughs> to do this, but I'm hoping maybe in the fall we can come back. But this to me, I mean, to go out with this Stage at Home, this is, Guys, I gotta tell you, I mean, we've been on all of them. Sonny, I think you've been on almost every one. Bill I, and Pat, I know I see your face. Julian, you're, I see all these faces that we see er, er, each week, right? You're, you're all here. And then the countless faces on Facebook that we don't see. But this was, Jason, you you have done amazing work, amazing work to put this together. You've done a brilliant job hosting this. And, uh, and I think that, you know, you could not go out with a bigger bang than having this group of artists uh, on this on this session, so that that's all for me. I'm 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 a, I'm actually a little verklempt that it's kind of. Uh, I really do. I really feel a little. I mean, I could kind of cry right now because this guy's been. I mean, and my daughter was on one of these a couple of weeks ago, but this one is absolutely my my favorite. I feel like this is this has been the absolute pinnacle uh, of this uh, of this programming. So so thank you and Jason. Thank you, buddy. Great well, thank you. That's Yay. very kind of you to say. And um, I think uh, we'll ask one last question, if each of you could very briefly, especially those of you who have done so much, August Wilson, uh, tell, tell me why it is you keep going back. Why do you keep going back to the, to the well for those of you uh, who do it often? Gail? <laughs> for the love, for the love, for the love that he brings us that I get a chance to share. Excellent, thank you, Mujahid. Well, it's, 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 the, it's the work I get hired to do. <laughs> 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 but, but I mean, it, it really, in a, in a real way, that is part of it, but, mm -hmm. but uh, um, it, it, it's rewarding for me to step inside the skin of these different men that I've been blessed to play. Uh, but I want to say one quick thing bef before, I, before, I, before we leave. Sure. Benny, our director, I heard, uh, I don't know what, who, some famous director saying that what his job is to do, film director, I don't remember his name now, is to bring in good actors and let them go. He said, the only thing I do is make sure they keep the theme. Mm. And I think that's, I'm pointing to the right of my screen because that's what I see Benny. But uh, Benny is that, was that guy, is that guy. Uh, I've known him for uh, more years than perhaps we won't talk about, but <laughs> Don't while. say it, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I got I, I got ideas about Troy, strong ideas about Troy that I, you know, and and he didn't 
stand in the way. He let me run with him and added some layers that maybe I might have missed or hadn't thought about or just some new thinking. And, and because of my opinion of him, my trust of him, uh, I implemented those. You know, we, we talk, but he, he, he let all of us just run. And that is the best kind of director. Hire good people, cut them loose, let them do what they do. Make sure they stay inside the ballpark, you know. So anyway, shout out to you, Benny, and shout out to everybody. Because as I said in the beginning, for me, this was a highlight for my career. Uh, it really was. I'm serious wow. about it. Wow. Wow. Uh, anyone else about why uh, why August Wilson, why you keep coming back to it? Uh, oh, Benny, man. we'll end with you. <clears throat> I, I just want to say August Wilson is a bad it's a bad brother, man. I mean, you can do you can do his work over and over again. And I thank God for another part of Opportunity. So I told you it was my first one that I've done. But doing that over and over and over again, more than hundreds of performances, you you can never go, but you can never go deep enough. There's always something that is revealed in this wonderful work. There's always something that you can like learn something just like, oh, that, I, you start making connections months and months after the show that you never would have thought about before. Yeah. And it comes to you and it's like, wow, he did that. He did that. So to do it over and over again, seven guitars, uh, Gail and the Jai, I want to go back to that too. I did seven guitars once. And I'm telling you, if I could just get another shot, I'm sure there's so many things, so many things that I could learn and I can explore about that character. And it makes you, his work makes you want to dig deep into the work because we don't find that. You don't find that kind of writing. And I've done many things, small, medium size, big, whatever you want to call it, but you don't run into all this world soon. And when you're blessed to be able to do it, you got to give it, you got to bring it. And I thank you, Benny, for bringing me on. I thank you, Jason, and thank you, Greg, for having me. It was a wonderful experience with these beautiful people. It was a wonderful, I will never forget it. Thank you. Uh, anyone else from the cast uh, want to yes. speak to I want to that? remind everyone, do you remember <clears throat> our last days before Benny left and what he did for us as a cast by letting us sit down and listen to the words when there were other people saying, yeah. rehearse them. He said, they don't need it. This is what they need. And he gave us what we needed. Yeah. It was like we were fed what we needed and then we were allowed to bloom. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I won't forget that. Mm -hmm. That was nice. In that conference room. Yeah. yeah. Remember how things just so, so just came to life, just in that listening room, just sitting world. around that table, listening to the, you're right, John. You that, know, listening to the, that made, mm -hmm. for me, that was a great leap of many things and faith among them, faith in us as a company. And once we had that faith, oh, watch out, baby. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. Two, re <laughs> two things. Uh, two reasons why I want to, why I would want to do more that definitely touches on what Brian said is that as actors, we're always looking for work that is challenging, you know, and August Wilson, it's beautiful, but also at the same time, it's not easy. And mm -hmm. it takes some work to dig into these characters. And we're always finding new things. I mean, like, as actors, I'm sure all of you have, you've gotten auditions for things, you've read the script and you're like, oh my goodness, this is horrible, you know? So we have quality work to work with that is challenging. Um, but also, like, as we were going through uh, just the table reads, in reading through the script, like, I've seen productions of Fences before and I thought that I knew what Fences was going in. Mm -hmm. And then as we sat down and read through and combed through the script slowly. I was like, there was so much that I did not know. I was like, I didn't know this character said this. I didn't know this thing happened. I thought I knew this play, but I didn't. So there's always new things to find with August Wilson. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Benny, I will give you the final word 
uh, about why August Wilson or why so much August Wilson. And I w before I go to you, I will say these, all of these actors, uh, I wish you could see all of their resumes. Uh, they, they've, they've done so much work. It's not just August Wilson. Uh, and the same thing with Benny. Uh, just remarkable, remarkable talents. Uh, uh, I think a chunk of modern American history is on this call today. So uh, thank you for being a part of it. Benny. It's 2,000 years of experience. <laughs> <laughs> First, I want to say, Johnny Ann and Joe Lee, you are as beautiful as ever. And I think yeah, you both are at least a half inch taller than the last time I saw you. <laughs> so it's nice to see Thank you. you. Um, yeah, I'm sending you love. So August <laughs> Wilson, for me, is, um, is an energy source. You plug in. And he fills you up and he reminds you as Africans in a new world how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. Men, women, and children of magnitude. Amen to that. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I say, actually say one thing? I'll say one thing, actually. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, this, I will say that this was my, my first August Wilson. Um, and... Obviously, like Daniel said, like when you think you know it, but then when you actually get in the room and you start really combing through it, you start to learn more and more that you didn't know. And with these particular groups of people, with these group of actors, many of them who have done August Wilson before, um, and not just Fences, but other, other of his work in the cycle, it made me want to search for it more. It just made, it, like knowing that I've always wanted to do it, but just being in the room with people who have such a, uh, uh, talent and such a um, kinship to it that it's just it shows you just how much how much this work uh, needs to be done um, how much this work is vital to I think not just the African American experience but just also just theater itself you know I just think this being in the room with these artists and that being my first experience with August Wilson it just like I got I can't stop. I can't stop. And I, I honestly, I cannot thank these people enough, Benny, everyone involved, that it was just the greatest uh, door opening to just the wealth of August Wilson. I'll yeah. That way. Thank you so very much. And for those of you on our, pan uh, on our Zoom call or on Facebook who don't know, uh, much of August Wilson's work, if Fences is the only one you've seen or read. Um, after this is over, I'll post on the Facebook um, page, I'll post some resources for you where you can buy the scripts, uh, where you can read those scripts. Uh, I encourage you to dig into it. They are, they are really tremendous, tremendous plays. They are substantive, important, uh, vital characters, and it's, it's work that, that um, uh, should be seen and, and, and you should read. Uh, so I'll, I'll put those things there for you. Um, well, here we are. This is officially the end of our day today. Uh, this is the longest stage at home, but I could listen to the re I could listen to you all talk uh, for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, but uh, sadly, we have to go. So thank you all so much for joining thank us for you. our twelfth. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And oh, final yeah. week of stage at home. Let's have one more virtual round of applause for our panelists. Thank you all so much for spending so much of your Friday with us. Um, <clears throat> thank you. To our Stage at Home viewers, a reminder that all the past talkbacks are available on Flutter Up's YouTube and Facebook pages. And of course, we're now a free podcast. Plus, in the coming works, weeks, we're going to rebroadcast every one of the episodes on Friday afternoons uh, until we know what the falls look like. I want to say a special thank you to the people who made this whole series possible. Brielle Daffeldecker, our marketing director. Joe Daffeldecker. Uh, our digital media specialist, Tim Billman, our production manager, Aaron Martin, our company manager, and Greg Longenhagen, uh, of course, our artistic director. I also want to give a brief uh, round of applause to all of you, uh, those of you watching. So give yourselves a round of applause. There's so many of you who have been here every week uh, and so many of you who tune in from across the country and we cannot thank you enough. Please remember that as this pandemic continues to grip the nation and the region and as numbers and cases uh, numbers of cases in Florida uh, rise, um, it makes our eventual reopening even harder to plan. So as long as we can't gather, Florida Rep is in a moment of crisis. Uh, and if you value Florida Rep's artists and the artists you've come to know and love and, and who you've gotten to know over this series, do consider making uh, a donation or even a recurring donation uh, while you're not coming to buy tickets. 
Um, nothing is too small at a time like this. You can call, email, or you can donate it online, and anything that you can give will ensure that we will be here when we can gather again. But the most important thing you can do is to wear a mask in public and keep your distance. Let's bring those numbers back down. So uh, all of those things to be responsible. It's not political. Just wear a mask to keep us safe and you safe, and we'll be back <laughs> sooner. Uh, um, Another thing you can do to support our team, uh, right now our January production of uh, Twelfth Night by William, yes, thank you, Benny. Uh, our production of Twelfth Night for young audiences is available online for streaming for just $12, and it stars the past season's acting interns. It's a professionally filmed production, and that's available at floridarep.org and floridareppeducation.org. Thank you all so much, uh, one last time, for spending the afternoon with us. And while we can't yet gather in the theater, we will see you there soon. So from all of us at Florida Rep, have a wonderful weekend, have a wonderful summer, and please stay healthy and safe. Thank you all so very much. Thank Bye. you, our channel. Thank Ooh, you, our thank you. Nice to see you, everybody. Hey! Bye. 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 Nice to see y'all. Nice to see y'all. Bye, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.